Okay, this video is from the book Prevent Dementia, Poor Man's Way to Prevent Dementia, and this chapter is called Traumatic Brain Injury, How to Rehab from Traumatic Brain Injury. We often abbreviate it TBI. And there's a lot of things you can do, and I think you can do a lot more than a typical place. So rule number one of rehab from traumatic brain injury is do not trust the Ivy League. They suck, okay? They, you know, they sort of became famous. One of these schools, I think it's one of the Boston schools. The lady's name's Ann McKee. She's a pathologist. She did a whole bunch of autopsies on the brains of these professional football players with chronic traumatic encephalopathy. They abbreviated CTE. And she's got this whole classification of CTE. And my attitude is, oh, isn't that nice? The guy's already dead. What good does that do him to have that? Now, don't get me, don't get me wrong. It's nice that they've got this brain bank library of autopsy brains of these old football players and some boxers and things like that. Great. But then the question is, what can you do to help them? And what I've heard coming out of some of these doctors from Boston, this is just my opinion here, but I know I'm right, is recommendations for the Mediterranean diet, which is completely stupid. The Mediterranean diet, I call it the Antichrist diet because it pretends to save people, but instead it hurts people. Okay, look at it. The Mediterranean diet allows olive oil, super fat, bad for blood flow, fish, chicken, nuts, seeds, cheese, MSG, MFG, processed food, alcohol. These are all terrible for the brain. You don't want any of that stuff. None, zero, nada, okay? The best diet is the same as best for everything. Low fat, low sodium, 100% vegan, starch-based, whole food, 100% organic, with no oil, no alcohol, no MJ. MJ is a terrible thing for the brain, too. It's a brain toxin, okay? Just like the Monty Python skate, every sperm is sacred. You want to think every brain cell is sacred. You've got the brain, okay, and then you've got the surrounding tissue. So let's say a person has a stroke, and let's say this orange thing is where the stroke is. I don't know if you can see the color there. All right, and so the orange tissue is dead. This is necrosis. The tissue around it that's yellow in this case with these markers here is called the penumbra. And the penumbra means it's ischemic, has decreased oxygen supply, but it's potentially salvageable. Penumbra means like twilight. It's not clear if it's going to be dark or light. So you want to save that. Save that by maintaining good glucose and oxygen delivery and protecting it from toxins. Whenever there's blood-brain barrier, whenever there's trauma to the brain, traumatic brain injury, or whenever there's a stroke, a cerebrovascular accident, you can call it, typically it's ischemic stroke, you will also get leaky gut in the, in the intestinal tract. That's bad because that allows pathogens and toxins like uh, bacterial endotoxin, LPS, lipopolysaccharide, for example, access to the brain. Bad, bad, bad. So... Neurologists don't know this, and PMR docs don't know this either. They should know it, but they don't, because nutrition, epidemiology, and toxicology are not taught to them. It's not in any of the medical school books or residency books or conventional medical books that I'm aware of. Okay, So what I'm saying is these patients should be put on a very careful diet and avoid everything on that list of things that cause leaky gut, because that way you help minimize the amount of toxins that are going to have access to their, their penumbra, where, especially in the early phase, post-trauma, where the blood-brain barrier is open. Okay. Normally, you've got to keep a closed blood-brain barrier because neurons have to maintain precise ionic radiance around themselves in order to function effectively. Okay, Brain fog can be caused by increased permeability of the blood-brain barrier. Okay, If I was a billionaire and I wanted to dedicate my life to helping traumatic brain injury patients, I would buy this giant park and have it for them with a lot of nature and where they could go bird-watching. Bird watching is one of the best things a person can do to increase brain function. It's one of the best things a parent could do to help their kids become more intelligent. You know, the famous saying of, uh, you know, Einstein, when somebody asked him, what do you do to make your kids smart? He says, read them fairy tales. They say, well, what else beyond that? He says, read them more fairy tales. And I think there's actually a lot of truth to that. You'll see a lot of cultures where the, where the people are smart, have high IQs, high academic IQs, high verbal IQs. An important part of their childhood is learning... Um, the stories, the history of their people, and learning their religious books, okay? Um, that makes a person a lot smarter. And people can learn certain things when they're young. You remember a story, okay? You remember a song. You don't remember the stupid stuff you learn in grade school, memorizing a vocabulary list that, you know, you forget as soon as the test is over. All right, so anyways, what am I talking about here? I had a good experience when I was at Stanford that a friend of mine uh, who wanted to become a professional biologist had, an, uh, had a friend of his who was this naturalist, professional scientist, naturalist guy, and they invited me to go bird watching him, and I loved it. We would go bird watching all over the place, and um, I was very into it. I was considering that I wanted to be a biologist. I kind of had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder. My dad was a doctor, and at Stanford, it's weird, but 
scientists, PhD biologists, were higher on the prestige level than were doctors. There was kind of an attitude. If you're a doctor, you're a sellout. You suck, you know, that kind of an attitude. And I kind of had this attitude, well, I want to outachieve my father because my father was always like this big authoritative figure kind of looking down at me, do as I say. And it's kind of like, well, someday I'll be a great biologist, better than you just being a regular doctor, okay? I, I had this attitude that someday I'm going to be great. I'm going to be better than my old man and he won't be able to boss me around anymore. I don't know, but that was that, that sort of burned inside of me. That was one of the main things. That wasn't the main thing. There were other things, but that was one of them that was pushing me because I, I was like motivated like this. Like a lot of young people are not motivated at all. So anyways, bird watching was great because when you get out there in nature, first of all, you're in some beautiful setting. It's a safe setting, you know, biophilia. We love nature when we feel safe. And, um, you start talking. You identify the birds by their plumage, by their motion. You start having conversations about them. And these guys that really know birds, they know the bird personality. Like blue jays are the are the a-hoes of the bird world. Okay, and they do all kinds of obnoxious, funny things. And there's other birds that have all these characteristic behaviors and tricks. And you start learning about them and talking about them. You're walking around getting exercise. You're getting sunshine. That's what the brain's made to do: walk on a path in a forest, a jungle, or a prairie and survive. You know. Choose, make a value judgment, choose where it's going, navigate past the obstacles in one's path, remember where you came from. All of these things are good for the brain, and that's what you do. It's actually exactly what the brain is designed for. Okay, um, let's see here. You have to memorize how to get back where you came from. It's very pleasant, generates good, nice, pleasant social conversation. James Watson, the co-discoverer of the structure of DNA with uh, Crick, um, that's how he got interested in biology, was going bird watching with his father. And I can tell you, these guys I was with at Stanford were the smartest of the smartest. Okay, the average pre-med at Stanford's got a 99.9 .9 academic abilities. And these guys were way beyond that. Okay, this friend of mine I was going with, man, he was the A-plus student in all these classes. And um, I really enjoyed talking to him and learned a lot from him. Okay, he taught me study skills too. Okay, um, okay a couple quotes now from Bessel van der Kolk, his book, The Body Keeps the Score. Okay, about helping a person deal with their stress. Because you want to lower their stress because the cortisol can overactivate the brain cells. It's bad for them. Overstimulate them. Push them into excitotoxicity, apoptotic, apoptosis, cell death. Okay, so here he goes. For adults and children alike, being in control of our cells requires becoming familiar with our own inner world and accurately identifying what scares, upsets, or delights us. Yeah, having self-knowledge, knowing why do I feel this way? Why am I getting kind of, you know, whatever, palpitations, my heart's racing because you're stressed about something. Well, why am I stressed? Why do I feel good about this? Why do I like this? Why do I like this person? Why do I like this place? If you learn to analyze these things, you recognize the emotion and the feelings more quickly and that enables you to be more socially adept, astute when you converse with people. You know why you're liking or not liking whatever's going on. Okay, Bessel van der Kolk continues, being able to feel safe with other people is probably the single most important aspect of mental health. Safe connections are fundamental to meaningful and satisfying lives. Yeah, so what that's all about, of course, is when you're with a friend, you can say whatever you want. You don't have to follow all these PC nonsense rules. Oh, I can't make a joke or anything, or I can't say anything, or they'll be offended by that. You know, the people who act that way, they pretend that they're like high-minded and kind, but they're really a bunch of jerks, okay? You know when you're around somebody you like who's a friend. You could say whatever you think, and even if it seems inappropriately, superficially, Whatever, there was a reason for you saying whatever you said, and why can't you just talk about whatever comes into your mind? You can be that way with a real friend. Um, so anyways, that's a sign of a real friend, somebody who you feel you could be yourself with instead of having to be phony and play games. Okay, so Bessel uh, van der Kolk continues. Being truly heard and seen by the people around us, feeling that we are in someone else's mind and heart, for our physiology to calm down, heal, and grow, we need to have that visceral feeling of safety. Yeah. That's what you get around people who care about you and who, who are really your friend, your true friend, okay? And like I said, too, my mom, that's what she was like. She, she didn't have to work, so she loved having parties at her house. We'd often have big parties, anywhere from, you know, just 10 people to as many as 100. And she would social butterfly all over the place and make sure everybody was having a good time. Anybody that was wallflowers, standing against the wall, didn't know anybody, she'd find something for them to do, introduce them to somebody. She made everybody so happy. There were lots of people that would only come to our house once a year, and man, did they love my mother. Uh, so it was uh, something to see. That's where I learned about social behavior and stuff. It's from my mother. Okay, another Vander Coke thing. My father was a, you know, he was a good guy. He was a nice guy, but he was not too social. And I think a lot of men are like that. And my whole 
time and knowing my father and living with him, I never in my entire life, not once, ever saw him make a social phone call. All of his friends, when they came to a party at our house, it was because my mother called his friends. Okay, and I'm almost kind of like that. I could easily go a month not make a single phone call. Um, sort of like anybody who really wants to talk to me can talk to me. Not that many people really want to talk to me. Nowadays, too, people talk through the Internet. They'll send you an email, a little comment on your, on your, on your video or something. Okay, for treatment of TBI. But I think intrinsically, men are much less social than women. There's all this modern BS about women being like men. No, you're not. Men and women are, are fundamentally different. I mean, they just a woman is more part of a social thing. A woman's got all these social things. Kids talk to their mother about everything. They talk to their dad about they want help with something in school or in a sport or something like that. But 90 plus percent of the stuff, especially when they're young, goes right to their mother, okay? They're almost embarrassed to talk to me about something like, Mom, there's no food in this house, or whatever it is. I think you know what I'm saying, okay? And the mommy, they get the unconditional love, but from the father, they need the reality check, the objective reality check they get from a dad. It's, less, it's a little bit conditional, okay? And that's good for them. Okay, then you need to sleep. Sleep's housekeeping for the brain. The lymphatic system is active. The brain cleans itself. At night, the brain can go offline. It can't go offline in the daytime because the neurons need precise ionic gradients to have their action potentials and whatnot. But at night, they can. The cerebral spinal fluid around the arteries, the perivascular space, the Verkhoff we in, it's opened up. More CSF fluid comes down that space along the artery, and then it goes across the parenchyma, and it rinses over the neurons. They dump out their waste products like English uh, people in the Victorian age dumping out their chamber pots in the street. And then it's rinsed away towards the venous side, perivascular space. And then it goes off into the lymphatics. Then it goes down into the lymphatic system, absorbed into the blood, goes to the liver. So what they're really doing is the, the brain cells are outsourcing their waste management to the liver, which is good because if they had to handle all that, they would need more organelles, more cell size. It would be harder for them to communicate so effectively and quickly, and the, the skull would have to be a lot bigger. So it's good the way it is, okay? Um, so yeah, you want to try to get your sleep at night. You know, a nap is good when you when you can, but it can also sometimes screw up your being able to sleep on time at night. Um, it's good for a person to read if they feel able to read. You know, there's of course a lot of variability in how bad bad brain damage is. You know, some people are brain damaged and comatose, a major trauma. But you know, most of most head trauma is relatively mild, but it can still have prolonged ongoing effects of brain fog and headaches and things like that. These are ways to heal. Optimizing blood flow helps everything to heal. Good nutrition helps everything to heal. Avoiding uh, excess dietary fat and sodium helps everything to heal. Avoiding all these toxins and all the processed food helps everything to heal. Okay, so reading is good. Uh, if you can read a joke book in a language, that means you know that language pretty well. So whatever the person enjoys doing, they should do it. And, you know, they're going to get some brain development. They're also going to get some exercise, and they should have as much social support as can be provided. I like this book called Stroke of Insight by Jill Bolt Taylor. She had had a hemorrhagic stroke. She was a neuroanatomist from Boston, and I think she was in her late 30s, something like that. She's got, you know, like I said, a TED Talk, Stroke of Insight. And what she did to rehab was she went and lived with her mother, and she rehabbed, you know, for about seven or seven years or so. Unlike, for example, a typical post-stroke patient will only rehab for a couple of months, three months, for example. And a lot of traumatic brain injury patients, you know, let's say they're young athletes, they're going back and playing far too soon. And that greatly increases the risk second time around of major brain damage. A lot of these pro football players end up demented at a young age because of that. The Norman Doidge book, uh, The Brain That Changed Itself, is quite good. It gives hope. So I think that's the kind of thing people should be reading or talking about. It talks about the concept of neurogenesis, new neurons being formed. There's also synaptogenesis, uh, new synapses on neurons being formed. There's also things that happen in the brain called angiogenesis. Good angiogenesis means to form capillaries around brain areas that are more active to make sure they have adequate blood supply. So you get angiogenesis, neurogenesis, synaptogenesis. You also get mitochondrial biogenesis, meaning you make new mitochondria. You get glycogen supercompensation, uh, laying down more glycogen. This comes from exercise. It also comes from having intellectual conversations, doing intellectual things. So it's great to have a friend who you can have intellectual conversations with. A lot of people don't have hardly any intellectual friends, and it's good to have at least one. Um, so you can have an intellectual conversation. And of course, you can't do the internet through email, through commenting on YouTube videos, etc. Power Foods by Neil Bernard was a good book. He mainly emphasizes saturated fat because it decreases blood supply to the brain. You know, all the fats do, but saturated fat in particular. Uh, let's see, Digestive Tune-Up. Uh, by John McDougall is a good book about getting your act together with food. Start Solution is his best book. Uh, 
Okay, uh, philosophy. The goal is incremental improvement. Yeah, you just want to try to get a little bit better each day. Because even if you can only get one-tenth of one percent, you're at least going in a positive direction. You keep on getting that every day, and you keep on doing that for, you know, there's 365 days in a year. That's adding up, okay? And a psychiatry resident friend of mine one time said to me, the bucket fills drop by drop. And that's true. That's exactly the right attitude to have. I have an attitude of gratitude. At least I'm still alive. I can, at least I'm still conscious and aware. I can try to make a little bit of progress every day. And you keep rehabbing for life, okay? And you'll keep on making progress. It might, be, it might be slow, but at least it's happening, and eventually it'll add up. Uh, do whatever is most intellectually challenging first thing in the morning. That's when you're smartest. Uh, like I said, Jill Bo Taylor just worked with her mom, which was perfect because she got, you know, total social support. She could sleep as much as she wanted. She did as much as she could each day and kept rehab. She did her rehab for eight years. She made, like, almost a full, complete recovery. She goes around the world giving talks now about her stroke recovery. Uh, walking is great. Like I said, you know, you get that neurogenesis going, angiogenesis, synapto, synaptogenesis, mitochondrial, bio, mitochondrial genesis, mitogenesis, okay? All, everything good is happening, okay? That's how you build up your study endurance, for example. Like a medical student starts out and they can only study three hours, but by the time the first year is over, they can easily study eight, ten hours a day, um, building up that intellectual endurance, okay? Walking gets the lymphatic uh, flow going because the lymphatics they run parallel to the blood vessels, but they don't have they're not connected to the heart, so they get their pump from the muscle action of walking. And you can increase lymphatic flow 10 to 30 fold just by getting a little exercise. So, exercise is great as long as you can. I'd be careful about lifting heavy weights, so initially you might get headaches from heavy weight lifting, so I would avoid that until you feel like you're doing really well. Okay, uh, pans and sans. So pans means parasympathetic autonomic nervous system. You want to try to spend as much time as you can in pans for recovery. Parasympathetic autonomic nervous system. That means relaxed, low stress, low pressure. That's what I like too about bird watching. There's no competition. It's just pleasant and enjoyable. So the person can do that without feeling stressed. Because you don't want to be stressed because then your cortisol goes up, then your catecholamines go up, then your glutamate transmission across your, your brain synapses goes up. You don't want that. You want peaceful, easy going easier to sleep. And we talked about nature, especially like that park. It can be pleasant having, like if, you had, if you're lucky enough to have friends and family around, great. Having a dog, getting your sunshine too also helps for healing, activates those nitric oxide precursors from the skin. Uh, let's see. Oh, then I like the path. And so you also figure out what you like. For example, I like good literature and, and art and all this stuff. And I used to love all this nature stuff. Five years have passed, five summers with the length of five long winters. And again, I hear these waters rolling from their mountain springs with a soft inland murmur. Once again, do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs that on a wild secluded scene impress thoughts of, okay, that's, you know, uh, thoughts on Tintern Abbey, okay, by William Wordsworth. So anyways, whatever you like and it's intellectually pleasant to you and maybe a, just a little bit challenging, that's good. Okay, and then here's a nice quote from this book, The Intern, by Jess Scott. When someone loves you, the way they talk about you, the way they talk to you is different. You feel safe and comfortable. Yeah, when somebody, that's a good friend. You can just be yourself, which lowers your stress level when you can be yourself. You don't have to worry, am I crossing some PC line that this jerk is going to hassle me about? Okay, um, Proverbs 17.22. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. And that, yeah, it's just like the Ben Franklin quote, or it's Jonathan Swift quote. The best doctors in the world are Dr. Diet, Dr. Quiet, and Dr. Merryman. Okay, so yeah, uh, eat the healthy food, get your sleep, and have a friends that you can joke around with and enjoy yourself. Comedy is very uh, great for lowering stress, okay? Um, hobby, whatever self directed attempts at something you're trying to improve that makes you happy to have a sense of a purpose, whatever's appropriate for the moment. Uh, we talked about pets, having a sense of purpose. People need that in life. If they don't have a sense of purpose, they can be sad, they can be frustrated, they also don't have good energy. When you've got a strong sense of purpose, that totally energizes you. Okay, And I think that was one thing. Like People who actually really know me, what they always say to me is they can't believe my energy level. Okay, Lots of things in my life are screwed up. I mean, I don't have that great of a life. Okay, But for what I have and what I can do, I make the most of it. You know, like I said, I told you, my kid one time said to me, he goes, Dad, why are you so happy? You're like the happiest person in the family. He says, but you have the worst life. Your life sucks. All you do is work and you're always studying, writing books or giving lectures. He says, why don't you do more fun stuff? Go to the beach, do all this other stuff. And I'm like, this is who I am and what I am. I like this. I'm doing this for a reason, okay? So when you feel like you're fulfilling your purpose in life, that makes you happier. So that's why if you're trying to help somebody, 
helping them to clarify what their purpose in life is at that moment is very valuable. And I love the old uh, Schopenhauer quote, forget about trying to have a happy life. You'll just end up miserable if that's your goal. Make it your goal to have a heroic life or, you know, you know, be a hero or a saint. Okay. Some people are a saint, like my mother. She was a saint and a hero. Or, you know, my father was kind of a heroic figure. So try to be that in your own life for whatever works for you because that sense of pursuing a worthy goal will make you happy. And it does. When you feel like I'm doing something good and I'm doing what I should be doing, you feel happy. When you feel like I'm doing something stupid because I have to to make money, you're a little frustrated, but you say, well, at least I'm getting paid. Okay. Um, and I'm doing it for the higher good of helping my family or something, you know. Okay, uh, listen to audiobooks. Yeah, and you can, an audiobook is nice because if it's easy, you can just listen to it slow. You can even slow it down to 0.75. But as you get good with it, let's say like when I was studying Spanish, I would first listen to it 0.75. Um, and then I, 1 1.0. And then when I got good with it, I could speed it up. And you could do the same thing. So what I'm saying is, depending on where you're at on the scale of recovering your cognitive function, you can just challenge yourself. They call it incremental improvement or comprehensible input, meaning something that's just enough to challenge you, but not enough to overwhelm you. Okay. And like if I was going to read a book that was easy for me at 1.0, I would be bored, you know, like a Brian Tracy book at 1.0, it can be almost a little boring for me. It's too easy for me. I've heard it before, but at 1.5, then it comes challenging and interesting and, you know, just tune it in. It's good to learn uh, study skills, memory techniques. If you're having trouble, you know, just write stuff down, whatever, whatever works. If you figure out how to cope for your uh, weaknesses of the moment, there's lots of memory tricks. You got to have a growth mindset, know that you can improve. Um, so anyway, I talked about study skills in plenty of other videos. All right, vegan diet, yeah, because that improves blood flow. Low, low, you know, no added salt, no oils, and low fat. That's how you optimize blood flow. Avoid alcohol. Avoid anything with high fructose corn syrup. You shouldn't be eating any processed food, and you'll get better blood flow. We talked about how fructose increases uric acid, which inhibits endothelial nitric oxide and decreases blood flow. And sodium does the same thing. That's why you want to avoid it. Sweets can also cause rebound hypoglycemia. Bad for you. Bad for your brain. Avoid powders. Any type of powder is always BAS. You know, like these protein powders, they dump a big nitrogen load on your kidneys. They increase your risk of kidney stones. They can increase your blood lipids. They often have tons of glutamate in them. You know, free glutamate from all the processing. Bad, bad, bad. I don't like that. Okay, avoid all this MSG. Potentially can have excitotoxin effects on your brain. Same thing with aspartame. Same thing with caffeine. Avoid all that junk. Avoid food dyes. A lot of them are mitochondrial inhibitors are toxic. Processed foods are always going to have a bunch of fungal inhibitors, which are often uh, neurotoxic. And watch out for medications, okay? The typical stupid patient thinks, oh, I got to take this medicine, I got to take this medicine, I got to take this medicine. And what I'm saying is, I'm 60, okay? I don't take any medicines. I don't have any health problems. What you want to do is try to figure out how to be as healthy as possible and minimize use of medications. You don't, you don't want to be sick. A sick person takes medicines. A healthy person doesn't need to take any medicines. That's where you would ideally like to get, okay? It's not normal to take a medicine. We've just been so medicalized, our society, that people think it's normal to take medicines. But it's actually, it's not. It means you're sick. you got a problem, okay? The average American over 60, I'm 60 years old, okay? The average American my age is on at least five pills. And they're all worried about their medical problems, going to go to the doctor. I don't go to doctors, I live healthy, so I don't have to go. What you want to do is avoid the medical system. And the way you avoid the medical system is make yourself healthy. If you can keep yourself healthy, then you can avoid it. That's what you want. Okay? You don't need to go for a checkup. Check yourself and get your act together, and then you probably won't get sick. Yeah, sometimes we all get sick and we need help, but most of the time, we don't. Okay, other things to avoid. You know, we said avoid loud noises. Like rock and roll concerts, I think they're stupid. They're too darn loud. I went to one like when I was in junior high. I would never go again. I think I maybe went to two too darn loud. You know, one time my ears kind of rung and I've, I've talked to an audiologist and he said he's seen people go deaf after just one rock concert. Okay. What a stupid waste that is. If you're somewhere and you don't like it, it's too loud. Just walk out. You don't need to be there. Learn to be above peer pressure. Okay. I'm above peer pressure because basically I consider myself a smart person and I think peer pressure is typically geared at stupidity. You must conform to whatever is you know, the conventional wisdom of the moment. And unless there's a good reason, I would think it through and I would just not go with it. If it seems, if you're not liking it, your gut feeling says this is bad, then avoid it, you know. Okay, like anything that's loud could lead to deafness. That's why I don't like making smoothies or, you know, these blender shakes because the thing's so darn loud. Um, that's also why I, I don't like, uh, you know, lawnmower guys should be putting ear protectors on. A lot of those guys go deaf. A lot of guys who work in a car shop, you know, pushing the air into the tire, they go deaf from that, that loud, sudden sound repeatedly. 
You shouldn't be using blow dryers. You know, wow, that loud noise next to your head and all that EMF. Stupid. Okay, try to minimize distractions. You know, like that guy said, um, the way you improve a brain is you train it more and more. The way you diminish brain function is you add noise, you distract it. That was Mike Merzenich, the inventor of the cochlear implant. That's his quote, and it's a smart quote. You want to improve brain function? Train that brain. Keep rehabbing your brain. You want to diminish brain function? Add noise and distraction. So that's why you want to be simple. Figure out a simple routine that you like and how to gradually challenge yourself a little bit each day to improve your uh, performance capacity. And then have a good attitude. This is a good quote here. This is the Hans Selye guy. He did a lot of research on stress. Adopting a right attitude can turn uh, negative stress into a positive one. You know, like, well, there before the grace of God go I, all these poor sick people, I could be like that. So thank God I have this opportunity to rehab myself, to develop myself, to recover. Um, every stress leads an indelible scar, and the organism pays for its survival after a stressful situation by becoming a little older. Being older means a little more fragile. Every major stressor leaves a scar. Adopting a different attitude convert, can convert a negative stressor into something positive. If you want to live a long life, focus on making contributions to others, and you should pursue your highest attainable goal. Right. So... That's kind of like me. I got a kind of a difficult life, but I sort of say to myself, well, I'll make the best possible use of my time. And for me, it's making these videos and all this educational stuff. And even though I don't make any money, and believe me, I got plenty of friends, even family members tell me, why are you doing this stupid educational nutrition stuff? Nobody gives a rat's ass. Just eat the vegan diet and forget about it. You should go moonlight and make more money. I make plenty of money, okay? I need my time. I need my rest. I enjoy doing this, okay? And I feel good about it. I feel there's a purpose in it. I feel, you know that it's something positive. I, I like it, okay? Um, so that's good for me. This lowers my stress, so I'll do that. And so everybody's got to figure out for themselves what it is to help their kid, to help, you know, some other thing that they think is good, whatever. That empowers you. That's how you get more energy. That's how you feel good about how you spend your time. Okay, uh, what are other things a traumatic brain injury recovery should do? Avoid TV. TV is for idiots. You know, if you want to watch a video, watch something on the internet, okay? TV, there's too many flashing lights, special effects. I, I haven't watched TV for decades and decades. I don't ever watch TV. Old movies are good, like the old comedies, but, you know, modern movies are bad. They're all crap. They're all PC with some agenda, you know, BS. Okay, you know, Hollywood is evil. We don't even need to talk about that. Okay, um, you know, tobacco. Forget about tobacco. Don't be chewing it. Don't be smoking it. That's for idiots. It's toxic. Avoid fumes. Anything that smells bad is bad. And don't be warming up your car. I got some friends and family. They'll warm up their car, okay? You know, use your judgment, but you don't need to, you know, and don't stand there talking next to your car while it's warming up. That's totally stupid. You're going to inhale some carbon monoxide. Just because it doesn't kill you doesn't mean it didn't hurt you. That's toxic to your brain cells. You don't want to be inhaling that. Okay, and like, don't be going to nail salons like a stupid idiot, smelling all those chemicals or VOCs, volatile organic chemicals, as they outgas and go from liquid to solid. You know, it's a stupid thing to be. Anything that smells bad is bad for you. Just assume that. All right. Avoid VOCs, volatile organic chemicals like paints, glues, liquid paper. If you have to be around that stuff, ventilate the area. Have a fan or open the door, open a window. Avoid endocrine disrupting chemicals. Yeah, because a lot of them are also neurotoxic. Eighty percent of them are also neurotoxic. Avoid hair dyes. The fumes are bad for the brain. You're going to sit there inhaling it. It's right around you all the time. You'll be using hairspray, all this garbage. Okay, so that's it for this chapter, and that was all about how to rehab your brain. So basically focus on whatever helps your brain and, you know, uh, get your sleep, avoid everything bad for your brain. I've made tons of lectures about all these things, but I'm, I'm kind of making that point um, that I think, TBI patients could do much better. They should avoid going back to the sport, especially football or something, right away where they're going to get more head trauma. And they should do all these things, get more blood flow, get their rest, sleep, and do all the things that they enjoy that are going to help them recover. Low-level activity, for example, and some ongoing intellectual challenge. So, anyways, hope that's helpful.